Thank you for coming to our BB and Uber Trust Seminar Series. And we have the pleasure of today uh, uh, having Dr. J Jasmine Hurd, who is the director of the Addiction Institute within the Mount Sinai Behavioral Health System at, at Medical School, and the Ward Coleman Chair of Translational Neuroscience and Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at the Icahn School of Medicine in Mount Sinai in New York City as you see that beautiful view that she has. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, doctor, uh, maybe you don't know, but Dr. Hurd is also a Caribbeaner, just like us, but she was born in our uh, uh, neighboring Jamaica. And so, oh, but she has a very interesting path of how she has come to a point of, of investigating such a, a, an important topic of drug addiction. And she is an internationally renowned neuroscientist whose translational research examines the neurobiology of drug abuse and related psychiatric disorders. And her research exploring the neurobiology effects of cannabis and heroin has significantly shaped the field. And using multidisciplinary research approaches, her research has provided unique insights into the impact of developmental cannabis exposure and the epigenetic mechanisms of denying the drugs protracted effects into adulthood and even across generations. And she is a basic researcher in the field of uh, neurobiology of drug addiction, but she also complements it with clinical laboratory investigation, evaluating the therapeutic potential of novel science-based strategies for the treatment of opioid addiction and related psychiatric disorders. And this includes pioneering work that we will see today. Uh, with cannabidiol for the treatment of opioid use disorder. And based on this high impact accomplishment and her advocacy of drug addiction education and health, Dr. Hurd was inducted in the National Academy of Medicine that complements other honors she has that she received in the field, including the Mika Salpeteer Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society for Neuroscience. So Jasmine, thank you so much for being with us and we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. It's really great. I wish this is, I mean, I really wish that I were doing this in Puerto Rico. Wait, let me um, move my pictures of everybody. Not that I don't want to see you all, the faces. Um, I really wish I were there with you all. I, I love my visits there and I hope that in the post-COVID, post-post-COVID world, we can get back to, um, you know, in-person visits. So, I, I, oops, let me make sure. Let's start the, yeah, here we go. So I would just give a, a, a quick thing, as Dr. Maldo says, you know, I am a fellow Caribbeaner and I'm from, I was born in Jamaica. And I know that this, you know, this audience is a lot of undergraduates and a few graduate students. And a lot of times you think that your journey is, is kind of or your path in life and your your journey in your in, in life is quite limited but it's not and this is one of the things for me in terms of my career um, I happened to move to the US in particular um, New York with my family when I was a, a teenager and but I'd always loved science um, throughout you know I was I can remember as a little kid and I all and I always loved the brain I don't know why nobody in my family are are doctors or scientists in that way, but I've always been drawn to that. And the US definitely gave me opportunities, but it also gives challenges as, you know, uh, someone from a diverse background where I didn't really look like, quote unquote, what a scientist should look like. And I actually ended up also going to Sweden. So, you know, when I look at all of these and people are like, oh, there have been so many challenges that you face being very different in many of these places. In Jamaica, I was a little girl who liked science. In the US, I was a black girl who liked science. In Sweden, yes, I was a black woman, but there, you know, they thought they knew that I was American. And for them, that meant that was something really great that I had to be the best. So I always say to people, you never know the path that life is gonna take you. But the constant for me was my love for science. And even though being different was challenging it in a lot of these different boxes, being different actually can sometimes help advance your science. So I think it's really important 
at least for me, my career in embracing being different and the questions that I wanted to ask and how I wanted to answer them, I think that difference actually helped to advance um, our science. And I particularly was interested in addiction, not initially when I was, you know, when I, as I said, I was very interested in the brain in, in, in large part, I wanted to know why people were the way they were in terms of their behavior. And I knew as a kid, the brain was a, and as I got to learn more about the brain and started studying neurodegenerative disorders, I started learning about the neurochemistry and we started playing with, you, you start using, um, um, administering drugs um, such as amphetamines and psychostimul other psychostimulants to tease out these, these, these networks in the brain. And it was just fascinating to me how these addictive drugs could completely change um, the behavior completely. And that's how I got into the, the addiction, which is really a complex disorder. And for me, it also had significant um, public health impact. I mean, and, you know, it's not that you have to do research that impacts millions, but addiction is, uh, I call it, you know, the U.S. is a, a, a drug country. We have over 40 million people who have a substance use disorder and even more who misuse um, substances. And this has caused, you know, the, our society, you know, trillions of dollars, much more than um, most other disorders. But the it kind of gets ignored, even though it has such a huge impact. We know that many people try many different types of drugs. There are many substances that um, are abused. And importantly, as I just said, the economic burden is huge. And for us, I, as Dr. Maldo mentioned, I am the a director of the Addiction Institute and the healthcare system is really under siege with, you know, with um, substance use disorders. And although there are treatments, most of them are not used or not suitable. We obviously, many of you know of the overdose deaths that we've been um, experiencing and just the stigma of addiction makes it really challenging. Challenging in aspects of trying to develop strategies to help people and be because of the stigma and also just in terms of getting the funding for for disorders that really, as I said, have such huge impact in our society. Uh, importantly, we were talking about COVID um, just, you know, briefly when we started, you know, COVID has obviously been horrible as a pandemic worldwide and so many different aspects. But one thing that is also clear is just that that stress and the social isolation has contributed to even more drug use during this time where we see that um, the, in, in the U.S. at least, the number of positive um, drug um, tests have gone up with a lot of the opioids in particular. But importantly also, what has gotten overlooked the past year is even that the amount of drug overdose deaths have really substantially increased even more. And we'd already hit like, you know, this, epi this epidemic of, of drug overdoses, and the majority of it is driven by opioids. So... As I said, I was told, you know, many of you obviously are, are students in the early phase of your career and just want to go through like some of the basic principles of what we know about the neurobiology of addiction, because there's been a lot that we know. And the question for me is always like, you know, how can we use that information to start guiding, um, developing and treatments? So we know of some, you know, structures and circuits in the brain that mediate different aspects of behavior relevant to, to addiction. So for example, an area called the ventral striatum, the nucleus accumbens, is really important for reward and goal-directed behavior. Our prefrontal cortex is also you know, important for cognitive control, the goal-directed uh, behaviors, and the amygdala for emotional regulation and so on. And the even though we've learned a lot, you know, we do know that many of the, the issues that we study often in addiction is this interplay between cognitive function and reward and motivational drive. So much so that we know that in people with a substance use disorder, their prefrontal co uh, cognitive control is lower and their reward sensitivity is higher and emotional, these drug memories and the, that contributes to the craving is in, enhanced. Um, this is just to show that, you know, um, individuals who do not have a substance use disorder, but they might have gotten, for example, 
a lesion um, in their prefrontal cortical areas, for example, they will show many of the similar behaviors that you can see in someone with a severe substance use disorder. For example, as I said, like you know, poor decision making, poor impulse control, emotional ability, and, and, and discounting you know, rewards. Oh, I mentioned and just showing again, you know, when um, neuroimaging studies are done and you put someone in a scanner and you will show them uh, someone, for example, who has a substance use disorder and you will show them, um, you know, drugs, their nucleus accumbens will become very active, for example. But that's about the reward. The, the, this, this ventral part of the striatum, which is called accumbens, like I said, the dorsal parts of the striatum are also critical for addiction. So rewarding aspects of a drug may start off with changing the nucleus accumbens, but the habitual behavior, that drug-seeking behavior, you then start to recruit these dorsal striatal parts um, of the brain. And that's really um, also, uh, it, it tells you, that, and I always say, addiction is not just one brain area, it's a whole brain disorder. Similarly, just emphasizing that when you show people when people start to crave the, their amygdala, this, this region in the brain also becomes activated. So as I said, we know that um, addiction is, a, as I said, a whole brain disorder with certain parts of the brain and certain circuits that might mediate certain distinct aspects of, of addiction. But because of the complexity of addiction, we see a lot of, of these behaviors or these um, phenotypes, these symptoms um, in people. So we know that there are multiple circuits that are involved. Importantly, there are many substances that people, as I showed in the, the beginning, many substances that are abused. And each of these substances have a specific pharmacological mechanism of their action. So for example, psychostimulant drugs like cocaine and amphetamine, they will elevate the levels of dopamine in the synapse. Other, other systems like cannabis will, will um, primarily um, target our endogenous cannabinoid system, for example, our endogenous cannabinoid receptors. And opiate drugs um, will target pharmacologically these opioid receptors. However, one of the things, oh, and however, we can say that many drugs of abuse, a common neurobiological um, alteration, especially with reward and especially early phases of the addiction, is dopamine. So, dopamine is a, a neurotransmitter that's really critical for many different aspects of reward, of, uh, reward itself. So, that when people, for example, use a drug like cocaine, um, dopamine levels go up, you, the person feels euphoric. But then when dopamine levels go down, they get dysphoric, this, you know, um, negative um, emotional states. And as I said, the nucleus accumbens is activated as dopamine is increased there. But one of the things that we now know about addiction is that a dopamine may start it. And of course, dopamine is still important for aspects of reward. But what we see over time is that this, we call it the, the synaptic plasticity, how the cells communicate with each other, the, the, the synapses. And these are these glutamatergic um, innervations, for example, from the cortex where glutamate is a, well, glutamate is the primary excitatory transmitter in our brain. And so we know that these, the synaptic plasticity is a key part of addiction. So although we know so much about, let me make sure I look at the time so I don't go over. Although we know that we, we uh, we know some fundamental biological systems important for addiction, we still unfortunately do not treat substance use disorder in meeting the need of like the over 40 million people that I said earlier have a substance use disorder. In fact, only about 17% of people who need treatment actually receive it. And that is one of the biggest tragedies that we have. And a lot of it is about stigma in terms of people don't seek help because of the stigma. There are governmental regulations because of a number of, and I'll show you a number of the medications that are available today are themselves addictive. So that becomes a problem. And just using science to start guiding novel treatments had been a barrier. So you know, so what are the treatments for substance use disorders, I think, is, is critical to understand. 
And from very early, I mean, from 1919, actually they had morphine maintenance clinics. And as you can see throughout the years, we've had different um, medications developed. And for those of you who kind of understand and see that many of these medications, the majority of them are actually related to opioids. And the last, um, and the two stars indicate those for opioid treatments, for example, methadone. And that was over 50 years ago. All of the other opioid treat, treatments for opioid use disorder still are opioids themselves. So they're, in terms of novel strategies for treating substance use disorders, we actually have not advanced that for nearly 50 years. And that is one of the challenges that we have in substance use disorders. So for me, my thought was, if I could understand what's happening in the human brain and then translate that to animal models, then perhaps we can try to identify neurobiological targets that could lend themselves to developing new treatments, treatments that people hadn't either thought of before and definitely um, that are non-opioids that wouldn't be, say, addictive. If, and I'm going to focus in large part on opioids, but I will talk about other substances as well. So I'm going to tell you three stories that we have in some of our research that's really giving us some scientific insights into where we can start to, to move for new treatments. And as I said, one of it starts with actually studying the postmortem post human brain. And sadly, many substances that are abused, such as opioids and, and cocaine, they have a high mortality. As it just showed you know, in the earlier, the, the overdose death. So we do have, unfortunately, um, a brain bank collection of, of, of people who died from overdoses, for example, with heroin. And you can look in their brains in many different ways. And we've looked in their brains, looking at the, the expression of genes and the expression of like thousands of genes and just trying to get an idea of what really has changed. And here's looking at the nucleus accumbens, for example. And when we look at the nucleus accumbens, you can see that the pattern of gene expression is very different in people who are um, uh, heroin users versus um, control subjects. And where those changes are, are interesting. And as I mentioned um, before, one of the things that we see with many substances of abuse, no matter what the pharmacological um, mechanism of action of the drug, over time, the repeated use of the drug changes the plasticity of the cells. And those, those are some of the genes that we see change in the, in the striatum, in the accumbens of people who are heroin users. So there are these glutamatergic changes. And glutamate, as I said, you know, inter intervention from like, the cortex that regulates striatal function. And yeah, just showing that the prefrontal cortex to the striatum, we know is a strong glutamatergic regulator of, as I said, of striatal function. But what was interesting was that another group of, of, of genes that, that a functional network that were significant and profoundly altered in the brains of, of human heroin users are those related to so-called epigenetics. So I mentioned earlier that addiction is a very complex disorder and you know, there are many things that can increase vulnerability for developing a substance use disorder. And we can talk about that if in, in you know, the, the QA um, period after. But you, we know about genetics, that genetic factors, the DNA sequence you inherit from your parents can increase um, addiction vulnerability, but so can the environment. And the environment is interesting because it can actually interface with the DNA. It can change the tags on the DNA. It can change how the, the genes are therefore turned on and off. And so the, just the environmental influence, and that's what drugs are, they're an environmental influence on how um, uh, genes, as I said, are turned on and off, genes that should be on now becomes off and so on. And these are called, that's called epigenetics. And the, when these epigenetic tags go on, the, there are many epigenetic tags that we know of, for example, you know, specific, those that specifically target the DNA, such as methylation, or these tails uh, DNA is wrapped around these histone proteins and these tails that come off, these histone tails can also be regulated and, and so on. I'm not going to go into all the, the, mechan the epigenetic mechanisms, but what they do is that they can either close or open up 
the 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 DNA so those genes are either turned on but it's open or it turns off when it's closed and one of the things that we could see in the brains of human heroin users was that these epigenetic changes correlated to even those glutamatergic changes those synaptic plasticity changes and so that the correlation even related to the amount of years that the person had used heroin so we know that epigenetics um, these mechanisms are being turned, are being recruited, are being altered by the use of heroin and by the amount of years that the person has used heroin. So, as I mentioned, you know, for me, the goal was trying to see whether or not what we found in the human brain could be translated to the animal model. And the reason is then in the animal model, we can then start to um, develop understanding the mechanism by which um, these changes that we see in humans are actually specific to the behavior. And we could then start to develop um, a treatment strategy and then go back to humans. And that's actually what we could do. We could see that these epigenetic changes that we saw in the human brain, we could actually replicate in our animal models of animals that self-administered heroin. So we can find the same epigenetic changes along these, these glutamatergic um, genes in the same manner. And these epigenetic changes that we saw were also very interesting. And they were interesting because they are particularly associated with a type of epigenetic mechanism where, you know, um, these epigenetic mechanisms, these tags are either put on um, the, as I said, put on um, the DNA or these histone tails, and then they have to be read, and then they have to be taken off. And one of the things that we saw is these particular uh, markers related to the the, these tags being read. And the, there are a number of, of drugs that can actually inhibit these particular epigenetic um, um, readers, they're called. And a lot of these inhibitors had been developed for the in the cancer field because cancer is a disorder of epigenetics gone awry, cells grow when they shouldn't. And so the cancer field has done a lot in characterizing epigenetic mechanisms and developing these drugs. So the question is, if we inhibit these particular epigenetic marks, could we mod you know, modify heroin self-administration in our animal models? And that's what we did. We could infuse these um, drugs into the striatum and we could decrease their heroin self-administration of these animals. And of course, we're not gonna infuse um, these drugs into people. So when you give it systemically, you can see here on the right side that it produces a, a significant reduction of heroin self-administration in our animal models. So from this set of studies, we, could, we, we know that these epigenetic inhibitors, which are not addictive or, or anything like that, that they could potentially be developed um, for um, uh, reducing heroin self-administration behavior. And we've also seen in other groups for other drugs as well. So that's one strategy that our research in studying the human brain um, gave us some novel insights into. So another strategy actually leveraged um, how we started to look at epigenetic mechanisms in the human brain. So Initially, we were looking at specific epigenetic marks, but we decided to also look at C in an agnostic manner, meaning in a manner where it's unbiased. We weren't looking at a specific gene. We just wanted to know if you look throughout the entire genome in the striatum there, in, and especially in the brain region related to habit formation of the dorsal striatum, if you looked in an unbiased manner at all the, 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 the genes, in the, but the epigenome, in terms of looking at where the genes are open or closed, and we could look in neurons as compared to glia, so we could separate the cells, what gene is mainly changed in people um, as associated with epigenetics? And it was really fascinating when we did that. So when you look into the DNA and you look at the epigenome, we found a gene that was, um, was the most significantly it was the gene most related to, related to the most significant epigenomic change in neurons. And this gene is called FIN. And FIN is fascinating because it sits at this postsynaptic density, as I told you, where the synapses and part of the regulation of the glutamatergic transmission. 
And Finn is also fascinating, not only for its regulation of synaptic plasticity and glutamatergic signaling, but actually Finn, it is a signal, it, it um, phosphor, let me go back. A fin produces a, a downstream regulation of tau, and tau is a microtubule. And tau, when tau gets hyperphosphorylated, which is what fin does, it phosphorylates tau, that hyperphosphorylated tau has been implicated in a number of neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease, for example. So it's like a classic pathological features of what we call these tauopathies, these neurodegenerative disorders. And we had actually seen that in the brains of people who are heroin users, that they actually had hyperphosphorylated tau. And it's not that I think that heroin is making people, um, giving them a neurodegenerative disorder like Alzheimer's. I mean, there are many different, um, the range of, of cognitive uh, pathology is broad. So Alzheimer's and those types of neurodegenerative disorders are at the extreme end. But as I said to you in the beginning, we do know that there are a lot of cognitive changes in people who develop a substance use disorder. So it could be, it could be something like that. And we could, um, in our both, we then go to our animal model and we could replicate what the hyperphosphorylated tau in animals that self-administered heroin and even in our cell culture model. So we know that opioids have the potential to produce this hyperphosphorylated tau that, as I said, is important for cognition. We could also um, use our animal model to mechanistically show that if you now reduce this expression of fin, you could actually reduce their heroin self-administration behavior. But again, if we're going to try to develop medicine, what we're going to try to do is to now use a medication uh, a, that is, again, non-addictive for, and that we can, someone would be able to take, um, you know, as a regular medication. So we wouldn't put a, a knock down a gene in their brain. And when we did that, there was actually an inhibitor of FIN that was being developed for Alzheimer's disease. And when we use this um, drug, it's called sarcatinib, which is also called AZD0530. Not a very, you know, many people remembering all the numbers, but you can just remember sarcatinib. And when we use it in our animal model, so when we allowed animals to self-administer heroin, we made it even harder for them to make sure they really wanted the heroin. And then we gave them the sarcatinib. And you could see it reduced their heroin self-administration behavior. So Fin is really critical, um, or, or the signaling up, um, that Fin mediates is important for heroin self-administration behavior. Importantly, when you're trying to develop medications for substance use disorders, you know, as I mentioned earlier, reward is a key part of addiction, especially in the beginning of, of the, the drug intake. And Reward is an important part for our survival in general. The natural rewards, we like eating, we like this or that. These are things for us to survive. So you don't want to have a medication that will reduce not, you know, all of the reward. It needs to be specific to the drug. And indeed, when we gave sarcatinib to animals that were self-administering now food, when you gave it to them, it did not impact on their food self-administration. So this medication, this, this drug for us is an important drug that we feel that now we can start to um, put it in the context of clinical trials. So both in relation to epigenetics and the synaptic regulation of the glutamatergic signaling and tau, we can now start to develop for medication for, or here is it, for, um, for treatment development. I want to emphasize it's not just for treatment and development of opioids because, again, we could see in a colleague, Dorit, um, Dorit Ron from UCSF, so San Francisco, they use sarcadinib in an alcohol self-administration and alcohol, all their alcohol behaviors. And they were able to see that the fin inhibitor also reduces alcohol intake. And I think that these types of, of medications, just like the first one I showed you 
with that epigenetic inhibitor and now with this tau in this fin inhibitor that it's not just specific for opioids but it could be um, used for even other drugs because most people with a substance use disorder not everybody but many people um, are poly substance users so it's not that they only use opioids they might also um, drink alcohol or other drugs so not having something only targeting one drug, I think is important for development. So then the last part, um, I think I'm showing you only three parts. I'm trying to remember if it was three or four parts I, I, I have here. So another um, part of my research in terms of trying to develop new treatments, this one actually came, started not from our human work, but actually started from our preclinical animal models, and then we were able to move it into the human. And it started off in our, in our research, looking at the developmental effects of cannabis. And, you know, one of the things for me, even though substance use disorders, addictions um, are obviously adult disorders in large part, we know that most of the vulnerability to it starts during early development. And that's one of the things that I think that gets lost in the, all the aspects of stigma. Usually by the time someone is an adult, their vulnerability to substance use disorder is so high because of so many things that happens during their lives. These environmental epigenetic things that I mentioned, it changes the aspect of the brain. But in any case, for us, we were looking at um, cannabis and on the developing brain. And in our human studies, we could see that there were you know, significant changes when mothers smoked cannabis on gene expression, but we could then translate that to our animal models. But the animal models helped us to look into adulthood on behavior. So for example, when we looked at adults that had um, prenatal exposure to um, THC, which is the, the potent psychoactive component of the, of the cannabis plant, these animals would self-administer more heroin as adults. And even when we made the conditions as such where they would self-administer the same amount of heroin, these adult animals with only prenatal THC, they would run to that first lever to get that first hit of, of, of heroin. But it wasn't only the prenatal exposure that we saw it in. Even with adolescent exposure and studied them as, as adults, they would self-administer more heroin. So we've done a lot of research on that. And I guess and that's not a, a big part of my talk today. Um, and I'm happy to answer any of those questions. But it was the foundation for developing a new treatment. And it was, a, it's a, it was the foundation because in our animal studies, as I mentioned, we gave the animals THC. So THC is the most prominent cannabinoid in the cannabis plant but the cannabis plant contains over 140 cannabinoids um, and you know, hundreds of other chemicals, other terpenes. So when we say in our animal model that we were um, studying cannabis, we were actually studying THC. So the question for me was, is, can a, the, do all cannabinoids do the same thing? And the second most concentrated cannabinoid, at least at that time, I mean, it still is the second most concentrated, it's just now much lower than before, that's cannabidiol or CBD as, as we say. So CBD, um, over the years, the concentration of THC has gone up dramatically in cannabis on the street that, and used recreationally. And the concentration of CBD has gone down. So we wanted to at least see what CBD does in our models. And as I said, you know, when we gave THC and we look at adulthood, we could see that they always, they, not always, there's a, a personality trait even in animals, but they would self-administer more, more heroin. We were actually surprised to see that, that CBD actually did something very unique. It actually reduced heroin seeking behavior. And heroin seeking behavior is interesting for me in developing medication because People, we always say addiction is a chronic relapsing disorder, but so are many other disorders, you know. But what triggers relapse is often this craving. And it's often something in the environment that triggers craving or stress or something that triggers craving and the person then relapse. And just like people 
people in our animal model, when they self-administer a drug, when they press a lever and they get this infusion of a drug, something goes, um, occurs in the environment to, to link with that drug. And for us here, it's a light or it could be an odor. And this light will go off. And in the future, you can just show them the light. They're not getting drug. And the animals start pressing away, trying to get the drug. And that's what CBD reduces. It reduces this heroin-seeking behavior. Another thing that was fascinating by CBD in our studies that I thought would be interesting for treatment was that even, um, even weeks after the last CBD administration, it still reduced their heroin-seeking behavior. So why would I think that CBD might be interesting um, to develop as a treatment? So as I said, um, uh, well, I actually didn't say, it's a cannabinoid that is not addictive. So unlike THC that induces the euphoria, the high, CBD does not do that. And as I showed you, it decreases heroin it's seeking behavior, which is important for um, relapse prevention. And it lasted even though it was no longer in the body. So for many people who are, um, have a substance use disorder, if they, they might forget to take their medication one day, they would still perhaps be protected by CBD, decreasing their craving. And importantly, as a neuroscientist, I wanted to know what's happening in the brain. And as I showed you earlier, in the brains of people who are opioid users and other drugs as well, there is this you know, significant um, re alteration of their glutamatergic transmission synaptic plasticity. And you, you could also see that in animal models. So for example, a classic, um, glutamatergic um, gene, when animals self-administer its um, heroin, it's changed, and CBD normalized that. CBD normalized a number of genes related to synaptic plasticity. So we wanted to see, does CBD or can CBD work even in, in humans? And so we conducted, well, it's a number of studies, but I'm only going to show you um, this, this last one. And what we did was to do a double-blinded randomized placebo control study. And it's important that it was placebo control because today many people, you know, you hear that CBD, you know, cures everything or, um, well, when we started, people didn't really know CBD it wasn't in the public as it is so much um, today. But you want to make sure that people are not just wanting it to work. And so that's why it's important to have placebo um, control studies, but it also should be double blinded. So it's not only that the participants are blinded to what they were taking, but even us investigators were invited in, in blinded into in terms of what the subjects were receiving. And so we basically did the same thing as we did in our first animal studies. And here, instead of heroin seeking, we actually looked at craving. And we could see that when, when um, participants and the participants were people who were heroin abstinent and they were shown a heroin cue and they were, had been given placebo, they actually craved. That's what, you know, we would expect. And CBD reduced that. Also, like the animal model, a week when we brought the people back after their last CBD administration, it still reduced their um, cue-induced craving. Also. Um, our animal models hadn't shown us at that time, and I just realized I forgot to put in a slide to show this, but we also uh, had um, looked at the many different aspects of the people, and one thing was about anxiety. And we know that anxiety is really critical. As I said, stress anxiety is critical also just as um, environmental cues associated previously with the drug for triggering craving and thus relapse. And when people were shown the heroin cue and they had been given placebo, they, were, they showed greater anxiety. And then CBD reduced that. And just like um, the craving, a week after their final CBD administration, CBD still reduced their, their anxiety, their cue-induced anxiety. We also looked at physiological measures because most of the measures that we take, like craving and anxiety, we're asking people and they're rating their, their craving, they're rating their anxiety. So we wanted, you know, physiological measures that you, it's not that you can lie. And so here looking at cortisol levels, the stress hormone levels, and we could see that in, in people who, um, you know, during neutral cues, their, their levels of their cord do not change. But when they were given um, the heroin cue and had placebo, 
their, their cortisol stress levels went up and CBD reduced that. Similarly, their heart rate, we can see that um, when they were shown the drug cue, their heart rate went up and CBD reduced that. So for us, we see that cannabidiol does hold promise for opiate use um, disorder treatment. And that's something that we're now developing and having the opportunity to study in larger and large clinical trials and also with neuroimaging in humans to really see um, can, can we triplicate because we've re replicated already? Can we, we continue to see these you know, effects of CBD and decreasing craving and anxiety and trying now to work out what's the most effective dose and the treatment regimen? But it may be for other substances as well. So for example, um, Bert Weiss's group has shown that not that with alcohol, and the, here, I just want to make sure to walk you through. So animals, this is during reinstatement, again, in terms of the uh, drug-seeking, alcohol-seeking behavior, they can see even, uh, this, these are weeks following their last CBD administration, seven weeks, a hundred and, or days, actually not, sorry, this is a day, a uh, hundred and thirty days, they still were decreased in their alcohol reinstatement or alcohol seeking behavior, whether environmental or here they did a stress, um, it's a, a foot shock with um, that they were able to, um, that CBD reduced alcohol reinstatement behavior. So it's not just only with, with opioids, it may also be effective for other substances as well. So, and the time, so um, one of the things all of our research has started to show, and for the, the, the treatments that we're trying to develop, we're trying to develop based on the science of what we see in the brains of people with a heroin use disorder, at least, is that there are these epigenetic changes related to synaptic plasticity, so that how the, the cells um, speak with each other and this glutamatergic um, dysregulation that might um, serve as targets uh, for treatment development, but also, CBD, cannabidiol, not THC, but CBD itself may be much more um, effective. And I can talk about THC because as I showed you in our animals, it actually increased self-administration behavior. So with that, I'll thank a number of the people on my team. It's a, definitely a village. We, we do a lot of, as you, you saw, multidisciplinary work in studying both the human um, brain and um, in animal models, I'll start with the human. So Ed Salsis is an amazing addiction medicine doctor. And um, a lot of our clinical studies are well informed by him. And he's like, really great with his patients. And Sharon Spriggs, that was the clinical coordinator for some of the beginning work. I didn't show our prenatal human studies um, with Yoko another time. Um, our clinical work now with CBD is being run with Karen Baki and neuroimaging with Anli Wang. Um, I want to, you know, there are too many people more to thank, but I will take questions and um, and thank NIH for their their support of our, our research. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Jasmine. That was such an excellent presentation. And I, um, of course, the topic of neurobiology of drug abuse is one of my favorites. Um, but I'll let Jose Enrique have uh, Dr. Garcia have a question. So I'll let him <laughs> he gets the first, first question. Yeah, yeah. I break, <laughs> I, I break the ice. So, yeah. Yes. So you you show how you find hyperacetylation in certain genes of the of oh, not the gene of the heroin users. Mm -hmm. My question is whether you can see the same profile in other drug users, you know, like, is there a common profile for anybody who's using different drugs that you can identify? So um, other group, another group had also seen, um, uh, wait, um, oh, don't, don't worry. Don't I won't stop. answer that because I'll be biased. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. No, so like, for example, cocaine, also showed hyperacetylation, um, and they were able to use an um, uh, acetylation uh, an inhibitor, the same bromo domain inhibitor, uh, and were able to decrease, I think, cocaine CPP, co condition place preference. Okay. Um, 
I, I haven't heard of other groups though doing self-administration with cocaine, but at least with cocaine um, condition place preference. So are there some things that are similar between drugs like this hyperacylation, um, especially for us, we saw around some of the glutamatergic related genes? Yes. But there are some other epigenetic changes that are, I don't know if they will say that they're unique, but there are some um, unique patterns between say psychostimulants and opioids, but there are some commonality. And one of the commonalities for some of the, the genes related to synaptic plasticity of this glutamatergic signaling is indeed acetylation, hyperacetylation. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I am going to have, I have two questions. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is about your work on the Finn antagonist. Uh, uh, any, any measurements on learning, any changes on cognitive function that you could talk about for, from the standpoint of, of course, of, of the population of heroin uh, uh, users? Yeah, so that's one of the things that we're, um, that's in the pipeline for us is looking at these fin inhibitors on cognition to see if, for example, cognitive effects that we see um, with heroin self-administration, does that fin inhibitor normalize as it? So, you know, people had looked at the FIN inhibitor also in alcohol, not just Alzheimer's, I should have mentioned with alcohol use disorder. So at Yale, they've been doing a number of studies um, with that. And they also saw in animal studies that the FIN inhibitor um, reduced alcohol intake. So they're now doing clinical studies with people with an alcohol use disorder. In the Alzheimer's study, they, the FIN inhibitor actually did not improve their disorder in terms of the, cog you know, the cognition. However, these are Alzheimer's patients. So perhaps you know, if they had, had started treatment earlier in their disorder rather than later in, then it might have been. But the thing that was interesting is that they also did neuroimaging and they could see that the, the, the damage that continues to occur in the hippocampus in people with Alzheimer's disease actually um, the FIN inhibitor reduce that. So it's getting in and it's actually improving the structural integrity, at least of like the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's really important. So perhaps for, as I said, if they had gotten, they started treatment earlier, um, in, they might have improved the cognitive outcome. But, you know, we'll, we'll see in our animal models because that's one of the things we're trying to look at cognition. Yeah. And so your route of administration was systemic, uh, Jasmine, for, for the FIN inhibitor? Um, so we have done different uh, routes, but yes, I mean, for okay. the ones that I showed you, it was systemic. Um, okay. Yeah, we put it in different areas. For example, we did it in the dorsal striatum, since that is actually where we saw in the human, um, the human brain the greatest, uh, or I shouldn't say the human brain, in the in human striatum. Mm -hmm. the greatest fin change, changes in fin. Mm -hmm. In the accumbens, it wasn't significant. It was the dorsal striatum where we saw the most significant change. And coming back to this whole aspect of addiction, as the person becomes more addicted, it mm -hmm. becomes more habitual. It's the habit. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the dorsal striatum perhaps is more critical for that particular change that we saw. Yeah, that's very interesting. And then the other question I had was, of your CBD studies in particular, what is, because the, uh, the thing is that uh, in, we have been looking at the interactions in our laboratory, the crosstalk between oxytocin and uh, cannabinoid system to mm. regulate anxiety. And we have found that um, there's co-localization of CB1 receptor and oxytocin receptor within the accumbens and the medial prefrontal cortex, which as you know, is a connectome related to drug addiction, and of course. Yeah. So it's interesting to see. And then I wanted to ask you because of the mechanism of action that the CBD, is it, how selective is it? Is it CB1 or CB2 or is it the trap receptors? What do you think? Yeah, so CBD is fascinating, and that's another reason I'm, you know, I continue to study it, not just because, well, because I do see that, you know, it may have potential for trauma, mm -hmm. but it's fascinating because it's actually not a, an agonist of the CB1 receptor. It's not like THC. So THC, as you know, is a partial agonist of the CB1. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Indeed, CBD might even be the opposite. It might be, it's an inverse agonist mm -hmm. at, the, at the CB1 receptor and it's weak at, it, at the, those properties. But it's, it has an action at multiple systems. So for example, like you're right, the TRIP-V, um, it may be an in, in, um, uh, inhibitor there. Mm -hmm. it, um, I'm not, all the things of like what CBD does is like hitting yeah. me, so I'm like going agonist and antagonist. So um, it also um, is an agonist at the 5-HT1 eighth, which might be one of the things, the serotonergic system, why it might also help with anxiety. And your thing with oxytocin may be interesting in, in that context as well. Um, it also is believed indirectly to potentiate um, endocannabinoid levels, um, adenosine. So there are so many, and the GPR55 is another that's the receptor where it seems to be have most potent um, effects. So it is, it, its effects on so many systems is one of the unique characteristics of it. And I think one of the reasons why I think it may be, you know, um, it's tweaking the synaptic plasticity of many different systems, but it does it in a mild way because it's not that it's powerful agonist or antagonist at most of these systems, it's very minor. And that might be why it has also very low side effects. So that's another thing. I mean, CBD has been given in very high concentrations in many research studies at now, and the side effects are, are pretty minimal, like, you know, well, gastrointestinal for very high levels and like sleepiness at very high levels as well. So I think the fact that it is, um, the fact that it has such um, its small tweaking effects pharmacologically at all these receptors and channels, it may be one of the reasons why it doesn't have so many side effects. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting that drug because of the, the, the pluralistic, uh, you know, actions throughout so many systems and then so effective in reducing uh, uh, substance use disorder, or at least uh, response, obviously, in uh, reinstatement and also anxiety related to uh, drug addiction. Yeah, and anxiety, you know, studies have been replicated in a number of groups, so which is which is really great. So now it's trying to find out the doses that would work. Yes. Because, you know, it can't work for everything in the same way. And so this is the thing what gets me frustrated that everybody, you know, is like, oh, CBD is, you know, the next best thing to slice bread. I, I think, you know, nothing is a, a miracle. There are no miracles. And in that context, I mean, I think it's science. And so you have to find, and medicine, so you have to find the right doses for a particular uh, indication and, and the delivery route even. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and finally, um, all your data is, is males. Do you look at females as well, uh, Jasmine? So we have, exactly. So we have, most of it are males, you know, in, except our human study. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so those are things now, it's always very challenging for us because we do these, especially these developmental studies and there's so mm -hmm. many. And New York does not have as much space as I would love. <laughs> but, and, you know, costs double the amount to run, double yeah. the amount of animals. But that's one of the things that we want to look at. Our human study suggested some it was small some maybe there may be some sex difference and that's why we need you know we're now um need these large clinical trials and we got a big grant to do that so that we can look at both sexes to just really um have that kind of knowledge that's that is so important oh well we will look forward to that data oh yes me, me too it'll be a while but yeah me too <laughs> okay. okay so i think we are um I we almost at the time of saying goodbye, and I really appreciate your presence here. And uh, you know, I the students obviously had a wonderful opportunity to get to know your research, and also uh, telling them that uh, Mount Sinai is also a possibility for research for them. And so, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. We will stay in touch to see how we can make some bridges with with uh, UPR and and your institution, of course. Yeah, so Carmen, absolutely, and, and Jose, too. Hope yes. to see you guys in person soon as well. Oh, yeah, we, we hope you. that you come back to Puerto Rico as soon as possible. And absolutely. We, have, we have this conversation, but in, 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 in person. person. 
Okay, you guys be good. Yeah, thank you, Jasmine. And I hope everyone join us for our last seminar next week with, with that we will have Diana Bautista from professor from um, molecular and cell biology and the Helen's Wills Neuroscience Institute at UCL, uh, UC Berkeley. So thank you everyone and I'll see you next week. Thank you, Jasmine. Cuídate. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.